on watershed nutrient legacies and their impact on current and future water quality in the Lake Erie Basin. This is the first of the Lake Futures webinar series. My name is Nancy Gaucher, and I'm a Knowledge Mobilization Specialist with the Global Water Futures Program based at the University of Waterloo's Water Institute. But I'm joining you in, from my home today, like probably many of you as well. I want to start by acknowledging that we are participating today from traditional territories of the first people across the country. Here in Kitchener-Waterloo, I acknowledge that I am on the Haldeman Track which is land that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River. The Haldeman Track is within the territory of the neutral Ashinaabek and Haudenosaunee peoples. I also welcome you to acknowledge the territory that you are sitting on today. If I could get us to move to the next screen. Today's host is uh, Lake Futures. It's based out of the University of Waterloo. Uh, a Canadian project that's being led by Dr. Nandita Basu, who we will be hearing from today. The project involves over 20 researchers from four different universities. Lake Futures is a seven year long multidisciplinary project that aims to deliver adaptive watershed and lake management solutions that minimize the trade offs between lake ecosystems, water uses, and economic growth. As we finish up the third year of the project, we decided to create this webinar series to connect our findings with external practitioners and other researchers. So the goal of this webinar series is to one, share our latest research findings, to two, uh, discuss implications for the research, including how this might inform water policies programs and plans in Ontario, and third, to promote dialogue between our researchers, partners, and stakeholders to inform the next phase of our research program. So Lake Futures is funded under the Global Water Futures Program, which is the world's largest university-led water research program, which has a goal of delivering risk management solutions for managing water in Canada and other cold regions informed by leading edge water science. With that, I'll move to the next slide. Just want to go through a couple of quick logistics before we get going, uh, which you guys are probably mostly familiar with. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the entire webinar, we would ask that you please use the Q&A feature in the webinar. That's uh, one of the boxes at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to engage uh, with us through comments or exchange of ideas or dialogue, please use the chat box for that. So we are gonna use the Q&A box for all the questions and that's just gonna help us sort through which questions to ask at the end. Uh, and then any other kind of commentary can please be added to the chat box. The webinar is going to be recorded and made available for everyone uh, later to view and you can also share that with any colleagues who may have missed the live webinar. Today's format is going to begin with a presentation from Dr. Nandita Basu followed by the Q&A. But once again, if you have any questions throughout the entire time, we encourage you to be noting those questions in the Q&A box. Um, to help us gauge who is with us this morning, we wanted, or this afternoon, <laughs> we wanted to begin with a quick poll. So I'll ask Kirsten to bring that up for us. We are wondering which uh, represents your organization, which best defines where you're coming from. Are you coming from government, non-government, maybe industry consultants, maybe another academic institution, or if we missed your organization, maybe you're in the other category. So I'll just give that a moment for people to fill out and select. Okay, that's probably enough time. Let's see the results. Okay, it looks like we have the majority of people from academic institutions, about half. But we also have a good uh, third from governments and a nice mix of NGOs and industry as well, a couple others. So it's really nice to see that there's a mix of different agencies and interests joining us today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today. 
Dr. Nandita Basu is an associate professor cross-appointed between civil and environmental engineering and earth and environmental sciences. She is the principal investigator for Lake Futures, like I mentioned, but also the director of the Collaborative Water Program with the Water Institute at the University of Waterloo. In 2019, she was also honored as a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Science. So with that, I will allow Nandita to take it from here. Thank you, Nancy. And okay. thank you, Nancy. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, being here today, uh, participating in this webinar. I would like to talk to you today about our research as a part of Lake Futures, focusing uh, on watershed nutrient legacies and how they impact current and future water quality in the Lake Erie Basin. A lot of our work focuses on trying to understand how past land use and land management affects today's water quality and how what we are doing today is going to impact our water for decades to come. What is the legacy we leave behind for our next generation? I will talk both about nitrogen and phosphorus, trying to uh, bring together a holistic picture of nutrient legacies and their impacts on water quality. Some of this work is a little bit more developed than others. Some of this work is in transition. It's, it's uh, students are working on their thesis. And I would like for a lot of, uh, for feedback, for understanding where you are coming for, what your interests would be in uh, this kind of research. Before uh, jumping into it, I wanted to start by thanking, uh, thanking my amazing group of students who I miss a lot now, given COVID and not being able to interact in person uh, for, for this work and also for um, research in our group. Wanted also to thank uh, Nancy and Kirsten, uh, who've been amazing in terms of bringing together this webinar and figuring out all the logistics. With that, I want to jump in and start with the obligatory green slide. So ag algae have been in the news. Uh, if you talk about Lake Erie Basin or globally, every summer uh, there's huge algal blooms uh, that occur both, uh, both in inland and coastal waters. And it blooms impact our economy. Uh, this leads to beach closures. It even impacts our drinking water treatment system. So here's a picture of the Toledo water crisis, which probably most of you are aware of, where in 2004, huge algal blooms in the lake uh, led to water that looks like that glass of water over there and impacted the drinking water treatment plant. And these algal blooms, while they're not new, but they have been really increasing in intensity in the last decade or so. So here's just a snapshot of all the algal bloom incidences or sightings in the Lake uh, Erie area around um, last year. So there's just huge number of uh, algal bloom issues in small and large uh, lakes uh, all over. And of course, when things like this happen, there's a lot of action taken to try to address some of these problems. Um, here is the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between uh, US and Canada that pledged to reduce 40% uh, phosphorus inputs in the lake uh, to reduce algal blooms in these systems. Uh, a lot of the algal bloom issues are related to phosphorus runoff from our urban and agricultural area, uh, the excess phosphorus runs off into the lake and fuels this algal blooms. This is kind of the space in which a lot of our research is situated as a part of Lake Futures. We ask questions like, how do we achieve a 40% reduction in phosphorus export to Lake Erie? And more specifically, the question that our research group tackles is how long will it take to achieve that 40% reduction? And why is this question important? So to answer that, I'm going to take you away to a different lake, Lake Winnipeg, to be specific. 
Apeg Basin is also another example of a basin that is really plagued by these phosphorus questions. Lake Winnipeg is also a highly eutrophic lake and phosphorus from the watershed that drains into the lake has been implicated in water quality issues. Now, this article came out in 2017 in CBC News where they made the point that a five-year fight was removing less than 1% of phosphorus from the Lake Winnipeg Basin. And this was happening despite spending $18 million on phosphorus reduction in the lake. This is the reason our work on legacies is important. A lot of the reason we don't see an impact within a short, like a five-year time frame, is because legacies of past action have built up in our landscape over decades. And when we make a change on the landscape, it takes time for those legacies to be depleted for us to see a measurable improvement in the water quality. We like to think about this legacy issues in terms of this broad idea that intensively managed catchments have legacy stores of nutrients that have built up over decades of fertilizer application. And because of this, when you are reducing an external load, so if you look in the image on the left, you see there's a point of external load reduction, but then there's this internal memory within the landscape and you would have to deplete that internal memory for the water quality to improve. In a really simplistic way, if you think about losing weight. So if you, if you start going on a diet, you won't lose weight tomorrow. It will take some time for you to start losing weight. The idea of legacy is very, very similar to that. Now, let me try to explain this idea of legacy using a really simple example in watershed over here, the Grand River watershed. This is a 7,000 kilometer square watershed that drains into the eastern basin of Lake Erie. It's predominantly an agricultural watershed, and it's also a watershed that's really rich in data and an amazing organization, the GRCA, that, uh, that helps in curating and making that data accessible. We started out doing a watershed mass balance. So I told you I'll flip flop between nitrogen and phosphorus. So now after talking so much about phosphorus, I'm coming back to nitrogen. I promise I'll be back with phosphorus in a bit. So here's a watershed mass balance for nitrogen. And this has been done if you look at the x-axis over the last 100 years. If you look at the watershed mass balance, the inputs of nitrogen are fertilizer application, biological nitrogen fixation, atmospheric deposition, and of course, manure. And then the biggest output is crop production. Take a note at the black line, which is the difference between the input and output. That is what we call the nitrogen surplus in the landscape or the excess nitrogen. This is the nitrogen that's not taken up by the crops and thus is available for running off to our surface water and groundwater and pollute them. The first thing that I want to note in that image is that the nitrogen surplus has been decreasing since the 1970s. So we are getting more efficient with applying the nitrogen we are applying to the landscape. Now let's zoom on that a little bit more. And what you see over here, the blue shaded area is that nitrogen surplus, but we have now zoomed on the last 40 years. We are taking away the 100 year part, so the last 40 years. And you see the nitrogen surplus peaked in the 1980s and has been decreasing since then. What's happening to the water quality in the stream that drains that landscape? If you look at that, you, you will see that the nitrate concentrations have been increased. And that's kind of scary, right? Surplus has been decreasing, but concentrations have been increasing. But if you wait a little longer, you see the concentration start to decrease. And this is this idea of lag times in the landscape, that uh, stream concentrations take some time to respond to increase, decreases in nitrogen surplus. Now, when you look at this, the first question that comes to mind, are there differences in these lag times across landscapes? It is similar in the Grand than the Thames or some other watershed. So we wanted to look at that question a little bit more in detail. So here's one example of one watershed in the Grand River. And this is the Grand River at Brantford. And again, the blue shaded area shows you the nitrogen surplus trajectory. And here you see an example of a watershed with long lag times. 
the nitrogen surplus has decreased, but nitrate concentration has been increased in most fine decrease. Compare them to another watershed, this is the lower Kanika G, and this one you see a much faster response time of the order of five to 10 years. And the reason lies in the Grand River watershed map. So the blue shaded area is uh, tile density. And what you find over here is that in areas that there's more tile drains, those areas respond faster because the tiles make the water flow fast through the landscape and you have faster response time. Using these kinds of methodologies, we can then map out lag times across the grand, and in this case, we found it to vary from 10 to 30 years. But this is still all about the past. How do we project forward in the future? How do we say, when we make a change today, how long will it take for the water quality to improve? And to do that, we need to develop a modeling framework, which is what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my talk. So we asked the question, how long will it take for the water quality? In order to do that, we first need to understand where this legacy is stored, right? How much, what form, where in the landscape. We conceptualize that this legacy is stored in three big pools. The first, what we call the hydrologic legacy. So this is legacy nitrogen or phosphorus that is dissolved in groundwater or in soil water. So this is nitrate in groundwater or phosphate in soil water. Then we have the biogeochemical legacy, and the biogeochemical legacy is legacy that is primarily in the root zone of soils. So think about sorbed phosphorus in the root zone of soil. We know phosphorus sorbs very fast to soil, so you have high amounts of phosphorus in the soil root zone. You also think about soil organic nitrogen as an example in the root zone of soil. So that is biogeochemical legacy. And then we have the network legacy. So this is legacy that is stored within the stream network, within reservoirs and riparian areas. And in this case, if you think about phosphorus as an example, phosphorus, particulate phosphorus, absorbs onto sediments, and then it gets stored in our reservoirs in our riparian areas. So we really need to understand what forms of legacy are stored in our landscape and in which landscape elements. And then we need to say, well, how are these legacies mobilized? And in this case, climate change becomes important. So when you have increasing precipitation in the landscape, then that would mobilize these legacies and pollute our streams uh, and lakes. So for example, if you have increasing winter flows, what legacy stores does that increasing water access and how does that contribute to pollution? We put all this together now in a modeling framework, uh, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the model in this talk. Uh, the model is called the element model or exploration of long-term nutrient trajectories. It is a process-based model. So you have carbon nitrogen cycling in the source zone, what you see on the left, and then you have groundwater pathways, and ultimately you have nitrogen loading at the catchment outlet. Uh, the model is fed by the nitrogen surplus. So we actually do a 100-year nitrogen mass balance using agricultural census data, and that is the input to the model, and that excess nitrogen is then cycled through the organic matter pool and mineralized for dissolved nitrate at the outlet. Now, in its broad framework element is not that different from a lot of water quality models out there uh, like SWOT and others, but there is a one essential way in which element is different and I wanted to talk you through it. When we think about any water quality model, we think about the landscape as an integrator in space. So a watershed is made up of many different types of, you have some cropland over here and you have some forested land over there. And each of these land uses are modeled separately and you get nitrate or phosphate coming out of those land, land, land parcels and you add them up to say what's your river seeing. But I wanted to explore this idea also as watershed as an integrator in time. So the water quality that you see in the stream might be a function of land use in the past. Another way to think about it is let's say you are on a plot of land that's forest. But 10 years ago, it was cropland and it was recently converted into forest. 
that plot of land will still be bleeding out a huge amount of nitrate. And so in order to know how much nitrate that's coming out of that plot of land, you would have to take into account the memory of that plot of land. And that's what Element does. It breaks up the landscape, not only into units of space, but each unit of space has trajectories of time, so units of time. And thus you can get the memory aspect of uh, the watershed integrated in the modeling framework more effectively. If you want to know further about it, we can talk, but for now I'm going to move forward uh, and uh, show you some results with this kind of modeling framework. So this is really new work, uh, hot off the press by Joy Liu, who's a master's student graduating next week. Uh, she developed the element model for 15 basins, sub-basins within the Grand River watershed. This is really interesting because we are looking at uh, kind of more headwatery upstream basins, and then we are also going along the Grand uh, with these uh, purple uh, squares and looking at how uh, legacy stores vary across these very heterogeneous landscapes. Let me talk you through this. So the biggest thing that we find and that we get with this model is what are the legacy components in various landscape elements. Before going into this, the model actually, I'm not showing you the results, model predicted trajectories of loads at the catchment outlet relatively well. So we had good uh, metrics for prediction and I'm not going to go into that. What the model allows us to see is how much nitrogen is in the various landscape elements. So what you see in here the black line shows the cumulative nitrogen surplus, so the cumulative excess nitrogen. And we are trying to figure out what's happening to this excess nitrogen. Where is this going? So this is across the entire grant. So we find that about 20 to 30% of it, so the yellow area, it's denitrifying within the landscape. So these are model outputs and the model is predicting that that amount is denitrifying. Um, then you have stream loads, which is the gray area. So there's a certain fraction which is going out in the stream. But then the red and the blue areas are the mass that is accumulating in the soil and groundwater. And we find that a significant mass in this landscape is accumulating in soil and groundwater. And this is important from a management perspective because let's say you're talking about nitrate in groundwater then doesn't matter how much uh, field scale nutrient management you do, that groundwater nitrate is going to come out into your stream. And the only way to deal with that if you want nitrate concentrations to go down is to have downstream measures like wetlands to intercept that nitrate. In contrast, if you look at that red area, which is the soil organic nitrogen, this is where your nutrient management comes into play. If there is so much soil organic nitrogen, maybe you can apply less fertilizers and get similar crop yields. So which part, different parts have different management associated with it? Of course, this is not homogeneous across the watershed. So what you see in this image is the same figure, but now we are looking at multiple watersheds within the Grand along the y-axis, and these are the proportional fluxes. So just as an example, the Kanakaji Creek is a tile drain watershed. There's, not, there's less stored in the watershed. There's more that's going out because of the larger tile drain. So the gray area in the Kanakaji is much greater than, let's say, something like the speed at Grub, right? So these proportions vary across the landscape. And understanding these proportions help us uh, develop better management practices. Okay, we are going to jump nutrients on you. So from nitrogen to phosphorus. So similarly, we wanted to also look at phosphorus dynamics in the Lake Erie Basin. Again, Lake Erie is dominated by agriculture. We did phosphorus mass balances. Uh, this is very similar to the nitrogen plot that you just saw. Uh, this is 100 years uh, of agricultural census data in the Lake Erie Basin. And here you're looking at phosphorus surplus, so the phosphorus inputs. The biggest component of input uh, in our landscape is manure, so manure is in blue. And then you have fertilizer phosphorus and a domestic phosphorus waste. And then, of course, crop uptake, which is in green, is the biggest output. 
The black line that you see is the phosphorus surplus. So two things. One is that we have a positive surplus. So there is more that we are putting in than we are getting out from this landscape. And second, the phosphorus surplus has been decreasing, but all that legacy phosphorus has built up over these decades and we need to address this. Now, after we, uh, we estimate this phosphorus surplus trajectory, then we add this phosphorus surplus to our element phosphorus model. And then again, in the soil zone, we have organic phosphorus and mineral phosphorus, active protected pools, we have sorption, desorption dynamics, all the fun stuff. But with phosphorus, we need to account for erosion, which we do, and we also need to account for retention in reservoirs and riparian zones. We also do subsurface routing of phosphorus, and ultimately we get phosphorus loading at the catchment outlet. So we ran this model. Again, we started with the Grand, and uh, for the Grand River watershed, our model uh, did reasonably well in terms of predicting uh, observed values of uh, total phosphorus between 1977 and 2011. But the biggest thing that these models tell us is if they tell us where the phosphorus is hiding or where the nitrogen is hiding. In the Grand River watershed, for example, we find that since 1900, about 4% of the net phosphorus inputs have been exported to downstream waters. 96% of the phosphorus is stored in the landscape. And if you look at this image, this is phosphorus accumulation and where it is, right? Similar to the nitrogen plot that you just saw. With phosphorus, we see that most of this phosphorus is tied up in the soils. There's some amount in landfills, and the remaining is in reservoirs and riparian zones. Again, this is really important from a management perspective because this tells us where to focus our efforts. Another thing that we wanted to explore with this model is can we independently validate these different stores of phosphorus or nitrogen in the landscape? This is really ongoing work. And in the near future, we would like to explore this more and more because these models have a lot of uncertainty associated with them. And the only, only way to reduce that uncertainty is to get more data about internal watershed processes instead of focusing only on phosphorus loads at the catchment outlet. So in this case, we wanted to say, well, how much phosphorus is stored in the reservoirs in the Grand River watershed? So here, we collaborated with Professor Roland Hall, who's a professor in biology at UW. He's a paleolimnologist. And with Professor Hall's help, what we did is that, and, and also with collaboration with Grand River Conservation Authority, we took sediment cores in the Conestogo and Bellwood reservoirs. And then we said, can we use these sediment cores to independently validate reservoir phosphorus accumulation? We did lead 210 dating of the cores, and based on that lead 210 dating, we estimated that uh, the reservoir was accumulating uh, sediment at the rate of 35 kilotons per year. That translated to 50 tons per year of phosphorus. Do some math, and bottom line, that boils down to 38 kilograms per hectare of, per, of upstream area. Now, how does that compare to our modeled estimate of how much phosphorus is being retained in the reservoirs? And interestingly, we found that our model was able to capture the reservoir accumulation relatively well. Our sediment data suggested that the number was 38 kilograms per hectare. Our model predicted about 43 kilograms per hectare. Now, you see no uncertainty associated with those numbers, and that's because it's really preliminary work. But we are working uh, on, on kind of bounding these numbers more. And ideally, we would want to estimate both the spatial variability of phosphorus accumulation within a single reservoir, but also phosphorus accumulation within reservoirs across the landscape to really try to bound these values a bit more and um, increase our confidence in our ability uh, to predict some of these stores in the landscape. Of course, now that we have developed a model, we have to do some prediction. And in this case, we used our Grand River model to ask the question about the 40% load reduction. 
what we found was that, yes, we can achieve the 40% load reduction, but it requires really stringent measures. And at least our preliminary results suggest that it will take about 25 years to achieve these preliminary because there are modifications that we are currently working on uh, in our model. So we're next with this. We're currently working on expanding this across the Lake Erie Basin. So Grand River Watershed, which is uh, the watershed on the right that you see in that image, uh, was the one that we focused on. This is the Lake Erie Basin. Two other watersheds where we also have modeled these legacies is the Thames and the Sydenham Basin. And we've just started our preliminary work on the Maumee River Basin. In this uh, Lake Erie Basin image, you also see uh, the red circles are total phosphorus concentrations in various stations in 2016. And the point that I wanted to uh, highlight here is that when you look some, at something like this, you think about hot spots and phosphorus concentration and where to focus effort. However, what this misses completely is how much legacy is already there in the landscape. What do I mean by that? So let's look at two watersheds in the Maumee and the Sandusky watersheds, which have been studied a lot. And things that you see over here, so the kind of shaded bluish gray area is the phosphorus surplus, the annual phosphorus surplus. And you see that for the Sandusky, the phosphorus surplus has been decreasing uh, since the 2000 and um, it's, it's, an, it's a negative phosphorus surplus. So this is a watershed where we are depleting legacy phosphorus. The Maumee, uh, it's still not in a depleting mode. But if you look at the total phosphorus concentrations, uh, they're relatively flat and have not been changing over time. Again, I wanted to point out that these are preliminary results. I'm bringing them up, not for exact numbers, but to highlight the point that uh, these patterns change. Uh, so when you compare that to some other watersheds across the Lake Erie Basin, you see a wide variety of patterns where uh, in the Canadian side, there is a lot of watersheds in which the phosphorus surplus had decreased in the 1970s, 80s, and now it seems like there is a slight increase, but total phosphorus concentrations in the stream have been generally on the decreasing trend. What we are doing now is analyzing these trends. This is only total phosphorus. We are also looking at soluble phosphorus and then developing element model for these watersheds and ultimately for the Lake Erie Basin, trying to understand the stores of legacy phosphorus in these landscapes. In the last five minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about like, what, do that, what does all this mean? What does all this mean from a watershed management perspective, right? How do we manage for algal blooms given legacies, right? Given that we know that what we are going to do today is not going to make a change today, how do we manage watersheds? And I wanted to highlight a few key aspects of this question. And the first I would say is, uh, let's not be afraid of legacies and lag times. We really need to quantify them and adjust expectation and not pretend that they don't exist, which I think we do sometimes. Uh, because that leads to a lot of uh, disillusionment uh, from, um, from policymakers and stakeholders. So we need to quantify lag times and adjust expectations. And in order to see evidence of success, we really need to diversify monitoring. What do I mean by that? Well, if there is a lot of legacy in our stream sediment and on our lakes, then we will not see an immediate effect of water quality improvement. However, we might see an immediate relatively faster effect of water quality improvement in a small tile drained field. So we really need to, when we make, when we do various best management practices, we need to monitor at different scales to really understand how water quality is improving across kind of the hill slope to large lake basin continuum, really understand those dynamics and develop models to, uh, to propagate those signals across the landscape. The second really important thing to keep in mind is the question of nutrient management. So if really so much nitrogen and phosphorus is building up in the soils, can we effectively harvest it? Instead of thinking about legacy as a bad thing, can we think about legacy as a resource? And 
little work that has been done in this context show that this is entirely possible. This is a really interesting paper that came out in ESNT where the authors brought about the idea of how if you could apply less fertilizer on the landscape, we could really draw in on these legacy phosphorus pools and um, improve our water quality while not sacrificing on our crop productivity. Um, this was a really interesting paper that came out in the Journal of Environmental Quality with Helen Bolsch and Jian Liu and others, where they showed evidence of real field scale studies where they were putting in less phosphorus fertilizer, so drawing down the phosphorus. Uh, crop yield remained exactly the same, but water quality improved significantly. Moving from phosphorus to nitrogen, some of you may be aware of the work done uh, with Canadian Water Network funding by Dave Rudolph and others, where they dramatically reduced fertilizer application on a plot of land, which uh, fed into, which was in the capture zone of a groundwater well. Again, crop yield didn't change, but nitrate concentrations that was going to the well dramatically reduced. So there is hope of doing this in an economically feasible way. And we need to think about doing it in a spatially and temporally targeted way because resources are not infinite. So we really need to understand where do we have those legacy pools built up and how we can tap into them effectively. And last but not the least, we need to think about downstream controls. So for example, if you're talking about nitrate in groundwater or phosphorus in reservoirs, there is no amount of nutrient management in a farmer's field that can address those legacy stores. So we really need to think about more downstream controls like wetlands and reservoirs to improve our water quality in our lakes and rivers. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and I'm open for questions. Great, thank you very much for that, Nandita. Um, we'll now move to the Q&A portion. So there are a couple questions in the Q&A box, but if you have others, uh, please feel free to add them and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next uh, few minutes before we close things up at, at two. Um, so the first question comes from Hugh Simpson. Uh, I think he's at the University of Guelph these days. He asks, regarding nutrient legacy sources, would the nutrients received and stored in Lake Erie bottom sediments also provide a long-term term source of nutrients such as phosphorus for many years? This seems to be possible given the shallow nature of the Lake Erie Basin which would have a, and I'm just scrolling down, which would have a similar settling regime to a stormwater management pond designed to settle out fine sediments and associated peat. Do you have any thoughts on that, Mandy? Yes, absolutely. And that's a part of, so in this, uh, I was focusing only on the watershed part of Lake Futures and indeed uh, sediments in, at the bottom of lakes uh, and how sediments in the bottom of Lake Erie act as an additional source of legacy um, is a part of uh, Lake Futures project. And uh, the, la so what, the Lake Futures has a watershed box and a lake box. And in the lake box, one of the key questions Questions we are asking is can we quantify the legacy stored in the bottom of lakes and the impact of those legacy stores on water quality. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, just to answer one quick question that popped up, will the presentation be made available? Uh, Nandita, are you going to be able to make your slides available as well as the webinar recording? Yes, I think I might I might have one or two slides which would not be available, but most of them would be available. Great, and we will make sure that everyone who's registered has access to that. So the next question comes from Emily Cavalier. In terms of management, because the tile-drained landscape responds more dramatically, it can also export larger amounts of nitrogen. But due to the lag that you're describing, the non-tile-drained landscape has a slower release of nitrogen. Is there any indication that there might be more processing of N, such as uh, denitrification, in the non-tile drained landscape? 
Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that we found when we ran our model, because that was the only way to answer that question for us, uh, is that we did find more evidence in our model results showing that the non tile drain landscapes that was more being removed by denitrification, whereas in the tile drain landscape, you were getting more uh, out uh, into the stream. Okay. Great. I'm going to move on to the next question. As long as there is nitrogen or phosphorus surplus, even if the surplus is decreasing, why would you expect to see nitrogen or phosphorus loads concentrations in the streams decrease? I would think the best you can expect is for the loads and concentrations to start leveling off. So so the question, if, I'm, if I might restate it, so uh, the question is why would you expect that when surplus decreases, uh, loads would decrease? Um, the expectation comes from our general, I mean, if you think about any models, when you feed in a reduced fertilizer application or a reduced surplus, your concentrations go down if you don't account for legacy stores, right? And that most most empirical and other approaches kind of work with that assumption that today's input is showing up in today's water quality and doesn't really account for the legacy aspect. So if you account for the legacy aspect, of course you would not see an immediate effect, but, uh, but sometimes, I mean, so I'll give you an example uh, from a more real life case study. Um, so when, we, when I was uh, a few years back, I was in Iowa and, um, uh, we were doing uh, uh, with a colleague these surveys with farmers and we were asking them questions. Well, when you do different kinds of best management practices on your fields, when do you expect nitrate concentrations in the streams to decrease? And 80% of them said between one to two years. So I think there is an expectation, maybe not within the core scientific community, but in the broader community that we, we expect to see water quality to respond within a one to three year time frame. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving things on. We have a couple of questions about modeling. Uh, one is, why would one be encouraged to use Element instead of say SWOT or other models to enhance agricultural conservation practices for reducing nutrient losses? So the question is the purpose of the model, right? So if the question is, if the question is, if I change a uh, management practice, how long will it take for my water quality to improve? That is when I would say you would want to use Element. If you don't care about that time frame that it will take for your water quality to improve and you just want to use the model to say, if I add a wetland or if I add riparian areas, what will be my water quality improvement percent, then you could use any of the available models and they will be able to give you that answer. But they will not be able to tell you that will you see that effect tomorrow or will you see that effect in 30 years? And that's when you would need something like Element. Great. And I'm just going to uh, tag on another modeling question. What do you think about combining a hydrodynamic model with a water quality model for lake resilience measures? Um, so if the question is about a lake hydrodynamic model, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's work that's been going on in, in coupling uh, hydrodynamic models with water quality models. There's a huge amount of work that has been done in this context already. There's some work that's been done as a part of Lake Futures, but there's a huge, a large number of people that are working on integrating hydrodynamic model with water quality model. Great. This question is about the reservoirs. So the two reservoirs that you mentioned are, are drained seasonally. Mm -hmm. Are they representative of other storage types? Um, yes and no. So there are reservoirs in the Grand that are drained seasonally. So they are representative of that group of reservoirs. Uh, but then there is a lot of, so this is where I was saying that this work is really preliminary because even though they are drained seasonally, there's a lot of heterogeneity in within those reservoirs too. Uh, so, so we really need to work in future towards understanding that heterogeneity and how representative this one Bellwood reservoir is of other reservoirs, or do we really need to sample a lot of reservoirs around to understand the spatiotemporal heterogeneity? Okay, 
And as you've done for reservoirs, have you considered measuring or calculating the legacy stores of nutrients in groundwater and soils to be able to compare to your model estimates? Absolutely. So that's one of the things that we have been working on doing. Uh, so when we did uh, this work for the Mississippi, in the Mississippi River Basin, there were estimates of soil organic nitrogen uh, in the databases. So we use that to validate our model when we're doing this in the Canadian data set. I haven't found uh, the soil nitrogen. I, we do have soil phosphorus estimates and we have loosely compared them to our model, but that is ongoing work. Uh, we're also working um, yeah, with, uh, with one of the new PhD students in my group, Danica, looking at groundwater nitrate and can we take sparse groundwater nitrate data and use them to understand groundwater accumulation and use that for model validation. So that's very much a uh, very active area of research in our groups. If anybody has ideas on how to do some of these things better, I'm mo more a modeler than a field person. I would love to talk more, but I think we really need to get better and better into quantifying these legacy stores in various ways. Great, thank you. Another question, do extreme weather events show up in the fluxes of nitrogen phosphorus in streams and lakes? And if so, Will that effect lead to higher losses from soils? Absolutely, right? So in, in our model, uh, till now, it is a little bit cruder on um, really high flow events and on the daily or hourly scale. We still are doing currently element model at the annual time scale just because we are looking at the last 100 years. Um, but we do take into account the fact that in one year, if there is a really wet year and high flows, uh, we do see uh, much greater phosphorus and nitrogen losses, and that depletes the stores, but also that leads to a higher flux. So that is taken into account. Again, but because it's physically based, so you have kind of an easy way of thinking about it is you have this bucket of legacy, and when you have a big event that flushes out more of that legacy, and when you have a small event that takes out less. So it is taken into account in that way. Great. So which watersheds are being targeted now or in the near future to determine historical legacy data? So we're still working on water. So we're broadly with uh, what one PhD student's work, we are looking at watersheds in the Lake Erie Basin. We are trying to narrow down on watersheds where we trust the concentration time series data over the last 20, 25 years uh, to say, well, we can model these effectively. Uh, like I said, we've kind of, uh, we've modeled the Grand, the Thames, and the Sydenham. We've started on the Maumee. So ideally, uh, watersheds within the Lake Erie Basin, uh, because at the end of the day, what we would like to do is model explicitly the watersheds we can based on data availability, and then and then model the other watersheds so we can develop a Lake Erie scale model, but then the other watersheds would not be validated. So we would use these watershed and the features of these watersheds to extrapolate to the ones that we don't have calibration data on. Great. Someone was asking if there's um, a map showing spatial variability of soil phosphorus in the Lake Erie Basin. Uh, there is databases. So we've, we've looked at databases that uh, we've received data from um, OMAP and others. And, and so there is some uh, spatial soil phosphorus levels, but most of that data, so the little bit of a challenge in using that data is most of the data that I've seen till now, and there might be others, is soil test phosphorus. And legacy phosphorus uh, is actually higher in magnitude than soil test phosphorus. And there are questions about what fraction of the legacy phosphorus actually shows up at the, as, as a soil test phosphorus. People are talking more and more about measuring total phosphorus instead of soil test phosphorus, but that data I, don't, I have not seen in, uh, in at least the Canadian side of the Lake Erie Basin. But I, ideally, if that was available, available, that would be really useful. Okay. Do you have any sense of how much money has been invested to reduce reduce external loads to the lake to Lake Winnipeg in terms of wastewater treatment plants and farms and I do not know the answer to that beyond just the slide that I showed with the eighteen million dollar quote. 
Um, and uh, so we will have in two weeks, Roy Brower, who is an economist in Lake Futures, and he will be talking about some of these numbers, at least for the Lake Erie Basin. Uh, I don't know if he's worked on the Winnipeg or not, but uh, I wouldn't know that number. Great. Yeah, Roy will be presenting on August 12th at the same time. So make sure you sign up for that if you're interested. Another question, have you ever interlinked the PFLUX modeled results with HABs forecasting in Lake Erie? Not yet. And part of the reason is uh, the HAB, I mean, so uh, one other part of Lake Futures is focusing on HABs forecasting, but the HABs forecasting is also dependent on uh, temperature dynamics and other factors. So we've not made that link yet, but that is definitely one of kind of the more future goals. Great. Um, do you have any comments on this? So do we need to modify ambient nitrogen and phosphorus levels in the context of legacy? Yes, is the short answer. And I'll, I'll explain why. And this is what I was trying to bring forth. Because if you, if, you kind, if you accept the premise that legacy exists in the soil, right? So there is soil organic nitrogen, sorbed phosphorus in the soil that is legacy then that means you can apply less fertilizers and get the same crop yields. And that will lead to better water quality. And indeed, plot scale study, so this is the study by Helen Walsh and Jian Liu, and also Dave Rudolph's work for nitrogen that I've mentioned. So plot scale studies do provide evidence that this is possible. It is possible to apply less fertilizer and not, um, um, not sacrifice crop yield. Of course, this is a really complex problem. It is dependent upon policies and incentive structures, and you can apply less fertilizers, but if your crop yield drops down, what is the insurance that you have? How do we know which farmer field has less legacy and which has more? So these kinds of things have to be figured out, but theoretically, from a science perspective, this suggests that you can apply less and get same crop yield. And somebody else was asking, can the element model be applied to more than just nutrient loads? So could you potentially look at historical contamination and the potential for remediation measures to see how long it would take to see changes in water quality? Absolutely, right. So the way it's written, and that's part of our reason, we kind of cheekily called it element is because we don't want it to be a nitrogen or a phosphorus model. And technically the way it is written, it could be uh, applied to multiple, multiple solutes uh, because legacies do exist. Of course, depends on what you're talking about. So if you're talking about something like an oil spill, of course, there's a different phase in question, right? But if you're talking about pesticides, it's really probably not that difficult to modify it to do that. We've been doing more also legacy models for estrogenic hormones and stream sediments and similar principles uh, still, still work. Great. Um, it also looks like groundwater contributions to legacy P were non-existent based on the color-coded charts and graphs. How do you account, um, and how do you also account for atmospheric deposition uh, of particulate P? So we did, I mean, so atmospheric deposition of particulate P is, is not, uh, so we got some numbers for P deposition that we added. It was not a significant component um, to our model. Uh, of course, there might be local cases where you might have some of that, but, um, and, and at least from the modeling perspective at that larger scale, it didn't seem like that was the groundwater phosphorus contribution was a, was a really big component. But this is also, these are also places where uh, if we had measured groundwater phosphate data or measured groundwater nitrate data, then you could go into the model and tweak the model parameters so that it will capture those and that will increase the robustness of the model. So again, I would not, I would not hang my hat on any of the numbers for now, but this is a process. It gives us the best estimates given current state of the knowledge of some of these pools. And as we get better and better quantification empirical data on the pools, we'll be able to constrain the model more. And are you able to differentiate between phosphorus from chemical ver fertilizers versus manures in the legacy surpluses? 
Um, so in our inputs, we have different inputs. So we do have the manure input versus the fertilizer inputs, and we treat them a little bit differently in terms of volatilization and stuff. But uh, then the inputs, and then there is the manure input does get eroded more. So there are ways in which the manure input is handled different than the fertilizer input in the model. Great. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to... Uh, and the Q&A portion. Um, we really appreciate all those really great questions. Um, Nandita did an excellent job of answering those um, very diverse questions as well. Uh, we have one last poll that we would like to ask you. Uh, so maybe I'll ask Kristen to bring that up for us. We're wondering whether or not you learned anything new. So the answers are pretty simple. It's yes, no, maybe, or maybe you're not sure, or you don't know. It'd be interesting to see if people thought uh, that there was some new content or not in this slide. Um, in the meantime, while you're answering that, uh, make sure you note that we have uh, an upcoming webinars in this series. Next week, we have Philippe Van Capellen, and he's going to be diving further into the role of dams and near shore zone on phosphorus flows along the River Lake uh, interface, and that's next Wednesday on August 5th. Uh, we also have Roy Brower, like Nandita mentioned, on August 12th. He's going to be discussing his research of people's willingness to pay for water quality improvements in the Great Lakes Basin. So the polling results show that 88% of people learned something new and 10% uh, were unsure, 2% uh, didn't know. So that, that's really, those are really great numbers. We are going to follow up uh, this webinar with a copy of the recording a copy of the slide deck uh, with a couple of tweaks to that and um, and also a survey. We'd really like your feedback to see how you thought we did and to uh, ideas on how to make this, this webinar series more valuable for you. In the um, following those two webinars, we're going to take a little bit of a break for the rest of the summer and we're going to return on September 9th. So keep an eye on your emails. We'll send out more information. We hope that you sign up for further emails and learn more, continue to learn about all the different research that's happening in, in Lake Futures. Uh, and I think that's about it. So thank you very much again for joining us. We hope to see you again. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you all.